widespread and is inoperable in the majority of cases. That's why you need to pay attention to the biggest risks and biggest solutions I'm revealing today, so you never get esophageal cancer. I'm joined by ear, nose, and throat specialist, Dr. Jonathan Abiy, who specializes in screening for esophageal cancer. And Lenata from the audience is with us. Hi. Uh, Lenata, why are you so concerned about esophageal cancer? Um, I just recently started experiencing um, a lot of acid reflux um, problems and heartburn. So I just want to see if I could be a possible risk for this type of cancer. All right, so first of all, I applaud your concern. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of this kind of cancer. I'll put these purple gloves on, because okay. I think to start off the process, you can put them on. Okay. I'm going to actually show you uh, what esophageal cancer looks like. Now, this is a normal anatomy. So we've got the esophagus here. That's a swallowing tube. We were just looking down there when Dr. Vee was doing that uh, little procedure to evaluate it. And the stomach is this sort of big bag down here. And the area that Dr. Vee was examining was right here. This transition is a dangerous place because acid in the stomach can come back up here. And if it does that a lot, guess what happens? You end up yeah. with this. Same thing. Here's the stomach here. You all see the stomach? There's the esophagus, but look what happened at the junction between the stomach and the esophagus. Wow. So let's go to the three biggest risk factors for esophageal cancer so we don't have that problem in our chest. Exactly. Oh, fair enough? And you can take your purple gloves off now. So, risk factor number one is eating a high acid diet. Now look at these wonderful things. And Dr. B, walk us through these six items that everyone needs to be cautious about if they're worried about esophageal cancer. I, I call this your six favorite food groups. <laughs> Caffeine, chocolate, alcohol, breath mints, raw tomato, and raw garlic. And what, why the breath mints? I'm curious about that. What the mint does is it increases acid production. I see. What the mint also does is it loosens the muscle that separates the stomach from the esophagus, which is a bad thing because an acid shoots up even further. As we showed that little anatomy lesson over there. Now here's risk factor number two. This one's a no-brainer, cigarette smoking. Now, Dr. Vee, smoking is bad for the lungs. We all acknowledge that. We all, we all know that. Why can it be just as dangerous, just as devastating for the esophagus? I, I call cigarette smoking the esophageal cancer perfect storm uh -huh. because the nicotine itself Similar to what mint does, it loosens the muscle that separates the stomach from the esophagus. The second thing that nicotine does is it directly increases acid production. So that's like a one-two punch. Right. And then we add what we know already about uh, cigarettes and nicotine. It's a direct carcinogen. So this you don't do, I, I partake, right? No, I'm not a smoker. We just smell. <laughs> yeah, she's good to go. All right. And the third risk factor, this is actually the reason uh, why we're doing that little procedure over there, is something called Barrett's esophagus. Okay. Barrett's esophagus. So we're going to do a little experiment together. Okay. Okay. Now, here's your stomach. There's the esophagus, right? We just did this. Actually, get me that organ if you don't mind, Dr. V. All right there. So I'm going to reproduce what we got over here, okay? Okay. So you see the stomach. You see the esophagus. Mm -hmm. Same thing as we have over here. Yeah. Now, when we take acid and we de touch it against our stomach wall, which is what it's supposed to do, watch what happens. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. You see that? Yeah. Nothing, right? right? About as boring as it gets. Right. Because you're supposed to have that, that acid there. Now, let's change things up a little bit. Let's say that I take that acid and you're lying down. It's bedtime. You're lying on your back. Mm -hmm. Or you've eaten one of those acidic meals. And now all of a sudden that acid slips from here, the top of the stomach, up into the esophagus here, right? Now as that happens, it changes things up a little bit. Yeah, it's bubbling. Bubbling, right? Mm -hmm. That acid is not supposed to be touching that very delicate tissue that we showed you earlier. And as that goes further and further, it begins to destroy the tissue until you develop the Barrett's esophagus. Wow. Yeah. Can you all see that? Is that pretty clear, everybody? Wow. Please don't ever forget that demonstration. Long-term acid reflux causes these kinds of changes and makes the esophagus look like this eventually. See the regular esophagus? Yeah. Look on the right. See how that's, it looks like it's been chewed away and someone's been scraping at it? Right. Like a rodent got in there, chewed it up. That's what the acid does. Now, those are the risk factors. We've been talking about those. Let's talk about solutions. First, solution over here. Why am I with a long clock there? Probably you want to not eat so late. Yeah, don't eat so late. you got three hours of quiet time uh, between when you have your last meal and when you go to sleep. Next big issue is how well you treat the acid that you have, the heartburn that you've got. So we've got uh, histamine blockers here, proton pump inhibitors, antacids, 
Uh, Dr. Lee, talk to us about medications, why they're so effective in reducing the discomfort and some of this burning uh, that we see, but let's also talk about some of the risk factors with them. They're extremely effective in eliminating acid or really, really cutting down on, on acid. The downsides that you mentioned, uh, and this is where diet comes in so importantly, is that these medications can affect how calcium is absorbed, which you need for bone strength. Right. Can I think, I'm going to go a little more, be more, more provocative about this. A lot of folks think that we have a very rapidly increasing number of esophageal cancers, perhaps because so many of us think that just because the pain goes away a little bit, because we're taking these medications, we're okay. You can still get that burning and not be aware of it because these medications will blunt the effect of the acid, but not remove it completely. So how many weeks of treatment before you see a symptom? And how long would you be on these before you finally throw your hands up and say, I got to get screened? Really, these medications are so good, within two weeks, heartburn symptoms will go away. But really, when you're having throat symptoms, that is as big a warning sign as persistent heartburn. Okay. The final solution is talk about, we've been hinting at, the nasal esophagoscopy. It's a procedure that you saw Dr. V perform a little bit earlier. Talk to me a little bit about how easy it is. Think of transnasal esophagoscopy as colonoscopy for the throat except two major things. You're not sedated. You saw our patient here wide awake, could even be talking to me. I would talk to him, he could talk to me. Robbie, how you doing, buddy? I feel great. It's okay? Very simple, very easy. I lost my father to this disease. Oh, no. So it was such a simple procedure now to get this checked. I wanted to make sure I wasn't at risk. You know, well, we're good. Well, congratulations Thank for your I'm sure about your dad. Thank you. Listen, everybody, esophageal cancer could be lurking in your throat right now. If it is, you have a better chance of finding a cure by donating to the Gregorio Family Foundation. They are 100% resource-focused on finding the cure for esophageal cancer. Go on to DrOz.com to donate. I want to thank all my guests very much, Dr. Aviv, for your wonderful work. When we come back, are your favorite foods causing cancer? Find out what items in your pantry could be putting you at risk. <laughs> Coming up.